When I first started studying media and technology in New York back in 2012, I felt alone. I used to go to conferences and events, but everywhere I went, I kept being reminded that I was an outlier because I was the only woman there. And I wanted to talk about technology, but the only questions I was asked was whether I knew where you could get coffee, if I was lost, or my personal favorite, is this the worst Tinder date of your life? A week ago, I was called up by an agency asking if I wanted to talk about technology at an upcoming retail conference. And uh, they warned me it would be a male-dominated room. And I believe their exact request was, we need you to tell us what women want. Tall order. Though I'll admit I was very flattered from their belief that one woman, myself, could speak on behalf of 50% of the population. The reason I'm telling you this is because this conversation describes a symptom of what's starting to dawn on leaders around the world. I'm telling you this because despite generous efforts to survive this next technological revolution, we're approaching it from the wrong end. Technology can only get us so far. Tech is the easy part. It's humans, unpredictable and diverse as we are, that's the difficult part. How many people recognize this room? It's a group of homogeneous people who sit together and they agree on a product or idea that resonates perfectly with their own needs and their own perspectives, but completely overlooking and ignoring the more important perspective of the people they're creating for. And while this might have worked absolutely fine in the past, that's not the case anymore. We're living in a world of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. The world is moving faster than ever and changing right in front of our eyes. And if we want to be the companies to lead that change, we need to include people who see the world differently. And let me just say that corporate leadership definitely does not represent the world it's attempting to lead. Because the fact of the matter is that there are more CEOs called John and David than there are women in the US. And before you arrest me and say, well, I'm sure that's not the case here in gender equal Scandinavia, I'm sorry to disappoint you. There are more CEOs called you hum than there are women on the Swedish stock exchange. More than 90% of CEOs in Fortune 500 companies are men. 72% of these are white. Less than 1% is black. Why is this a problem? Less than a century ago, our businesses were local and analog. Today, and as if you've heard of these past few days, business is global and digital. Ten years ago, 1.4 billion people were online. Today, 4 billion people, more than half the world's population, is connected. 2.2 billion people are on Facebook, 90% of them are outside of the US. And this means that our products and our services are no longer tailored to or affecting the people in our immediate proximity, but have the potential to engage millions of customers and touch billions of lives anywhere in the world. And that means tremendous, tremendous opportunity. But it also requires us to think differently and learn faster. And we learned from Stephen Kotler yesterday that learning faster is what is going to make us succeed in the long run. And I will argue that diversity is the key to that. Because diversity is not charity work. It's a business imperative. Anyone here have an iPhone? Well, of course, this is Scandinavia. Well, I too am an unapologetic Apple fan, and in 2013, Apple's CEO, Tim Cook, he argued that a diverse workforce fosters innovation. He said that embracing people's individuality is a matter of basic human dignity and civil rights, but it also turns out to be great for the creativity that drives our business. And according to a growing body of research, Cook is right. In 2017, McKinsey examined more than 1,000 companies in 12 countries, and they found that the companies who have the most ethnically diverse executive teams outperform their peers on profitability by 33%. A recent report from BCG found that the companies who score the highest on diversity also derive 38% more of their revenue from innovative products and services compared to other companies over the past three years. And you might also be very pleased to know that some of the most innovative companies in the world and coincidentally, most happy countries in the world, also have extremely high levels of female labor participation, including Sweden, who ranked third in the Global Innovation Index in 2015. 
Congrats, guys. The BCG report finds that diversity has an especially positive impact in complex companies. And in today's world, complexity is less of a choice, but a necessity. Companies can't just rely on one source of revenue because they face so many risks. We love working in homogeneous teams, but when we do, we tend to engage in a concept called groupthink. And this results in unchallenged ideas, which often leads to flawed products. But we love working with people who are similar to ourselves. But when we do, we tend to converge. And I'll show you a classic example of how this works. The trench coat, and subsequently, one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality, but little by little, he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall. Here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> you get the picture. To quote President Obama, who I had the honor of hearing live a few weeks ago, he said that if you look around in the room and you're surrounded by men, you have a problem. You will not succeed. You need diversity to have a sustainable business. And besides, if everyone in the room is like you, you don't need to have the meeting. So if we know this, why don't we have more diversity on our teams? Well, the inconvenient truth here is that stereotypes, myths, and our inherent bias to prefer people who are like ourselves is the reason leadership still looks the same way today as it has for centuries. I would like to introduce you to Hans and Hannah. Now, this was a case study originally conducted at Harvard 20 years ago, but reproduced in Norway in 2015. Researchers gave 100 students a case study about a very successful leader, and they asked them to evaluate that leader. 50% of the students read the case in which the leader's name was Hans. The other 50% read the case in which the leader's name was Hannah. Now remember, exactly identical case aside from the names. Raise your hand if you think they judge them the same. Smart people. The students who read about Hans, they saw him as a better leader, likable, one they would like to have as a mentor or grab a beer with. The students who read about Hannah, Sarah is less of a leader, less likable, bossy, and a worse parent. Remember, Hans and Hannah were assessed by master students in the world's second most gender equal country in the world, proving just how deeply our stereotypes and our biases affect our perceptions, our decisions, and ultimately the makeup of our workforce. So there are plenty of products that have failed due to the lack of diversity. But as our world is increasingly global and technological and driven by algorithms using sometimes biased historical data, diversity is truly essential and fundamental to avoid reinforcing our biases and flawed decision-making overall. Does anyone here use Google Photos? It's one of my favorite apps, too. And it uses AI to categorize all my images, just like Anita was talking about yesterday with Apple Photos. Anyways, if I want to see any photo where I'm on a beach, I just type beach and they all show up. But what if I opened the app one day and saw that my face had been categorized as a fish? Sounds kind of hurtful, right? And I'm sure you're all picturing me as a fish from this point on. Well, in 2015, Google came under fire for labeling people with dark skin as gorillas. Gorillas. Now, Google, a company of 72,000 employees, a company that publicly advocates for diversity, only a fraction of the employees are black. 
More than 70% of leadership is white. And this failure is not just a slip. It's A, incredibly demeaning, but it's also indicative of just how badly we're doing as the early architects of what is going to become hugely powerful and complex systems for shaping lives and determining outcomes in our convergent exponential future. Another research study shows that one of the widely used data sets used to train these facial recognition algorithms consists of 75% men, 80% white people. An MIT study found that some of the most popular algorithms are 99% like, uh, likely to accurately identify a white male, but have an error rate when it comes to 35% when it comes to uh, identifying a black woman. Now consider these kinds of failures in the future. Imagine how they will affect us when we start to scale our AI systems into everything from our hiring decisions to our loans to our insurances, even to our self-driving cars. Lack of diversity has and can have deadly consequences. The very first airbags actually killed more women and kids because the product team consisted of men who designed with their own weight and their own height chart in mind. These examples are vast, and as leaders of the future, we need to build a future in which history does not repeat itself. And now to the recipe. So what do we do? Well, has anyone here ever tried to change something about yourself? You know, start working out, or stop drinking coffee, or stop snoozing, which is my case. And then, have you succeeded from one thought to the next? Well, think about how hard it is to change something about yourself, and then imagine having to change thousands of you in an organization. People are not a quick fix. And while there is no one proven recipe to succeed with diversity, there are a few low-hanging fruits and fundamental ingredients that will help you on the way. And one of them is role models. Research shows that they actually have a tremendous effect on women and minorities who are not otherwise equally represented in a company. A recent study from Microsoft shows that if a girl has a role model in STEM, she's more than twice as likely to be interested in the field. So a bank that we work with, DMB, they've launched a variety of different initiatives to improve diversity, one of them being Dream Girls, in which they showcase women in senior leadership positions. And combined with many other things, they're now on the trajectory to succeed with 40% women on all leadership levels. And kind of a side note, I don't think I would have the courage to stand here today if it wasn't for kick-ass role models as Lila. Another thing is neutral benefits. Research shows that more than half of men are negative to implementing diversity initiatives because they consider them favorable to women. And at the same time, we know that a lot of these initiatives tend to box women and minorities. So what we've seen with the companies that have been truly successful is that they have benefits that benefit everyone. So for example, D&B, they decided to close the pay gap, and they set aside 17 million Norwegian crowners to bridge the pay gap regardless of the gender on different levels. And instead of having female conferences and networkings and all that kind of stuff, they just set the bar and said, we're going to have 50-50% women and men on all conferences. A male-dominated private equity company that we uh, work with, they uh, made it mandatory for all women and men to take maternity and paternity leave in order to level the playing field. And then many companies feel frustrated because they just don't get enough diverse or female applicants. But I don't want you to give up because there are actually a lot of things that you can do, small tweaks, that have a tremendous difference. So a CEO told me a few weeks ago that one of her employees was frustrated because they weren't getting enough diverse applicants. So she decided to view the application. And I'll let you do the math. How many think that the uh, application to the right got more diverse applicants? with the awesome problem solver and the outstanding communication skills. You guys are all so smart. She changed the words awesome problem solver and outstanding communication skills to team player and good communication skills, and she was able to quadruple the amount of female applicants, and she also changed the picture from male to female. This company has been able to increase their uh, gender balance from 21% to 40% since December. And now that we have it, use technology. 
a large tech company that we've talked to, they recently implemented a recruiting game from Arctic Shores that within, uh, I think, 25 minutes, they're able to gather 5,000 data points on an applicant, providing objective scores. And they've been able to increase their female hires by 50%. Another company called Gap Jumpers does kind of the similar things, and they've been able to improve diversity by 65%. So, our corporate gardens are full of low-hanging fruits, but unfortunately, they'll provide little to harvest unless some of the fundamental ingredients are present. And one of them is leadership. It has to be anchored in leadership. So, for all leaders in here, and I know you are many, you can't do it alone. But the change does start with you. And the other thing is to be patient. McKinsey found in a survey of over 200 European companies that are trying to work with uh, diversity, only 16% succeed. And rather than understand why, they either give up or they continue with efforts that they don't see any results from. But imagine if you wanted to increase sales in your company. You wouldn't provide just one discount code, and then if it didn't work, you'd tell your boss, I'm sorry, no one wants our product to shut down the business. If you did that, you'd most likely be fired. You'd do whatever it takes. You'd come up with a fancy campaign, or you'd introduce a new product, or reevaluate old products. You'd do whatever it takes, and eventually, you'd most likely succeed. And the same goes for diversity. An inclusive culture is not built in a day. Diversity has to be part of the company's overall strategy and baked into its DNA. And the third fundamental is data. As we learned from Karen, or was reminded from Karen yesterday, what gets measured gets managed. And if you don't count it, it doesn't count. And I don't mean the generic stuff. I mean the nitty gritty. Our company is measuring data points on 10 different indicators, separated into five roles, divided into, uh, separated into five levels, divided into two roles. Because only then can we understand where the hole in the leaking pipeline arises, and we can start some accurate patchwork. And finally, my partner and I have interviewed now 20 CEOs for the book we're writing. And although they have varying strategies to improve diversity, they all have one common denominator. And that is at one point in time, they made an executive decision to get over the what, to get over the why, and just do it. Another similarity is that a few years after this decision, they're all on the trajectory to succeed. So inspired by Nike's wise words, just do it. We've been operating in homogeneous teams for centuries. We do what works, and then we do more of it. And we've predicted outcomes based on what we know. We don't tend to consider the broader scope of possibilities unless something forces us to do so. And on March 15, 2016, the world learned of one of the biggest breakthroughs in AI history. The Computer Go program developed by Google DeepMind beat South Korean 18-time world champion Lee si dol in one of the hardest games in the world with more possible outcomes than atoms in the universe. The world watched in disbelief as it looked at this computer place highly unpredictable moves, placing bets that had never been done in the past. Uh, that's a very, that's a very surprising move. <laughs> I, thought, I, thought it was, I thought it was a mistake. Um, well, I, I thought it was a click miss, but... Um, a click since, if we were online yeah, go, we'd right, call yeah. it a click go. Yeah, it's a very strange... Something like this would be a more normal move. Um, um, okay, actually, you're going to have to... So, yeah. do you have well, to, you have to think about this? This would be a kind of a normal move, um, and black would... In short, AlphaGo showed us a different approach that proved more effective. It showed us that even though we've been playing this game for centuries, we still haven't discovered all the possibilities. And I like to think that this is true in many fields. We don't know what's possible until we're able to see it ourselves. But when we introduce and include new perspectives, we are able to succeed better too. Now, the encounter with AlphaGo disrupted human gameplay, and it introduced Lee Seedol to new perspectives that ultimately made him a better player. I believe we all learn this way. I believe diversity will make us all learn faster and eventually all better players. In the book, What Works, written by Harvard researcher Iris Bonnet, she talks about critical mass, meaning that 30% of a minority has to be present in order for an individual to represent itself as opposed to the minority that they belong to. And I think that this is a very important point to think about when we assemble our teams. 
I think the products behind me here are great examples of teams that probably didn't reach the critical mass. Because I don't think that many men in here would run to the shop to buy a donut just because it's called a bronut. Just like I don't think that that many women will choose their bank based on what scent their bank cards have. Improving diversity is going to make it so much more easy for us to tap into so much potential because the people creating the products will actually accurately reflect the needs of the people they're creating for. In the future, we'll have incredibly powerful tools at our disposal, but it will require a lot better leadership in order to use these tools responsibly and the power of building a better world for everyone. Yesterday's leaders created today's problems, but you guys are here today, and that gives me tremendous hope that you are the leaders who will create tomorrow's solutions. Thank you.